Hello and welcome to another edition of Further Explorations by Request, and it's a feature of Approaching Music Theory, Melodic Forms and Simple Harmony, a class on Coursera. And in that class, I pick musical examples that help us figure out what language works for us when we try to figure out how music functions. And as such, I pick examples of music that I like and that I think help clarify some of these issues. But I understand that we all have different tastes and I really want to start a conversation with you about what pieces you love and to try to find language that helps us understand how those pieces work as well. So today we're going to look at Fratres by Arvo Pert, which is requested by Bati and about five or ten other people. It's by far the most requested piece. It really strikes a chord with a lot of people from a lot of different musical backgrounds. And we'll talk about that. And then I'd like to look at A Walk to the Paradise Garden by Frederick Delius. And this was requested by Peter, who asked a marvelous question. Can you please try to explain to me why I love this piece so much. And well, yes, I can try, but we'll never get there. And that, I think, is part of the joy of looking for the language of approaching music theory. All right, let's go. So let's start with Fratres by Arvo Pert. And I've put links to recordings in a Spotify playlist and also in the description of this video. So if you're not familiar with this piece, or even if you are, go ahead and listen to it first. Pause the video, come back, and try to begin to come up with language of your own, of how you think this piece works. And then, after you've listened to this video, let me know in the comments here, or on the comments in the Coursera class, let me know what you think and whether you would come up with slightly different language or whether you disagree with me or agree. I really want to know what you think. So let's talk first about Arvo Pert because it's important to understanding this piece and it's something we're going to come back to at the very end. Arvo Pert from Estonia started out like a lot of people of his generation as a modernist, as a serial composer. And what does it mean to be a serial composer? Does it have something to do with breakfast? Have I mentioned that the jokes just don't ever get funnier? What a serial composer is, is someone who looks at notes as ordered events. And that sounds cold, but it's really not cold at all. What it is, and another way of putting it, is an alternative search for tonality. And so you get people like Schoenberg and Berg and Webern and Boulez, and they want to find a stable way of creating sounds. A stable means that there's a sense of regularity and consistency that they like. None of those composers write what they consider to be ugly music, even though if you're coming from a tonal background, you might think, oh, oh, oh that's, oh, what's going on there? And Arvo Pert was part of that movement of Central European and Baltic composers, people like Pendretsky and Goretsky and Ludoslavsky, who wrote very highly controlled serial music. And then, like all of those other composers, they said, OK, um, now I want to do something completely different. And Arvo Pert started a lifelong journey towards what some of us now refer to as holy minimalism. In other words, minimalism, it uses very few musical elements. And holy in that he's quite religious and he had a religious awakening right at the same time that he changed the way in which he wrote music. And all of these things we're going to come back to, and all of these things actually relate to the notes and how we can talk about music theory. And I think that's the coolest thing. Music theory that actually interacts with the very personal, spiritual, and social import of the music. So let's get started. Here's a score for Fratres. And I have to say, there's lots of different pieces called Fratres, and we'll see why. This is, I think, the original, which is a string orchestra and some percussion. Later, he wrote solo versions. Then he wrote for violin and piano and cello and piano. Uh, 
and we'll see why that is. It, in a way, Fratres is a constellation of pieces that are organized around the same musical material. And what is the musical material? Well, here, take a look. Here, the violins are divided. And just take a look at those violins. They're doing this. And in the middle, you have the violin two. And together, they sound something like this. It's very arresting. And then it goes on and look what happens. It's kind of the same. There seem to be more quarter notes here, some half notes. And just look at the melody for a second. Let's look at the top line here. It sort of sounds a little bit like chant, which is, after all, a religious tradition. And the note values are very similar. It moves mostly by step with a couple leaps. And sure, there's some accidentals, but you know what else it looks like? Be still, my heart. It looks like counterpoint. It looks like one of those lines. It looks like a musical exercise. How can something that looks like a musical exercise sound so amazingly beautiful? Well, to answer this question, we're going to look at a musical exercise. <gasps> Trigger warning. Are you ready? Here it comes. Ah, it's a counterpoint homework. In fact, it's a counterpoint assignment from the Coursera class approaching music theory, melodic forms, and simple harmony. And I know, I know, I see the statistics. I know some people look at this and go, this is not music. I refuse to engage with this. And it doesn't look like music. Look, there's whole notes. There's a blank staff. I have to write something in here, really? It's not gonna be musical. Yes, it will. Just, just stick with me. And maybe after 10 minutes of this video, you'll wanna go back and redo some of the assignments or even maybe do them for the very first time, as Madonna would say. Wait, what? Well, I find counterpoint very touching. And here it is. You have a line. And that's called a cantus firmus. You can't change it because you want to come up with fixed relationships that make sense, that describe some sort of system. And here's the line over and over again to show you that within that system that you are writing against this fixed line, within that system, you can come up with lots of different musical solutions. So what are some musical solutions? And if you get bored, what happens? Well, here's an example that we also looked at in the Coursera class that's going to be relevant. This is from the beginning of No Word from Tom from the Rake's Progress. Maybe you remember this, but let's take a look at it again. Because here's the way Stravinsky wrote this. And what I want you to do is to pretend that this is a counterpoint exercise so that then when we go back and do a counterpoint exercise together, then you'll be able to take something out of this and maybe imitate it. Here's an example of Stravinsky doing something kind of contrapuntal, but with non-standard rules. And I think you can figure out how we got there. We've looked at this in the Coursera class. Look at this dissonance. poignant and empty and longing, as if the soprano's fiancé has run away to gamble his fortune away and sell his soul to the devil. But that's the opera rake's progress. I think the opera would be a little less dramatic if Stravinsky lowered this line down a step, resulting in lots of consonances. Look at this! Oh, that's kind of gentle. Check this out and check this out. All I'm doing is lowering this line a step. It's much gentler. It's like, eh, maybe I'll go find my fiance. Maybe I'll just relax a little bit. And the opera's over. Anyway, you can see something semi-deliberate 
perhaps this line was in Stravinsky's mind, and then he just sort of raises everything by a step, leading to wonderful dissonances. And I think this becomes relevant to Arvo Perret because it's a system. It's systematic, and Arvo Perret is extremely systematic. And, okay, let's go back to counterpoint homework. We'll get there. We'll get back to Fratres. I promise. Sometime. Soon. And here's a normal, boring, I mean, lovely, transformative counterpoint exercise. You could do something like this. It's a six, a fifth, a three. Passing forth, hey, dissonances pass. Okay. And you can begin to hear that everything here is consistent. Okay, that sounds like the Renaissance. But now, just like Stravinsky, let's experiment moving this line down a step, keeping it in the same mode. Let's be experimental. Sounds vaguely modalish, tonalish, but there's so many wrong notes that we, we need to come up with a new system to describe it. And let's do one further experiment. And these exercises, counterpoint is an experiment. What happens when I do this? How many different ways are there to do this? And believe me, Arvo Perret studied counterpoint. Trust me. So Let's do something completely different. You're just bored. Take this melody. And now these red notes down here are an exact inversion of this, but an exact inversion. So this goes down a whole step. This goes up a whole step. Whoa, and it starts a tritone away. Here's the top melody. And here's the bottom melody. Can you hear that? What happens when you put them together? I don't know. Let's experiment. Okay, and you might not like it, but it's starting to sound a little bit like Bartok. Shh, don't tell anyone. Bartok loved doing things like this. And it sounds very different and it might sound foreign to you, but I think it sounds consistent. And the question of the day, okay, we're talking about experiments, we're talking about counterpoint, but can we please get to Fratres? And what would Arvo Perret do? Well, let's look at another Stravinsky example, because this is kind of what Arvo Perret does. And it's not original to him, but the way he treats this device, Arvo Perret, is wonderfully original. Here's the device. Look at this movement from Igor Stravinsky's Apollon Musa Jete, which he wrote in the late 1920s. And it's a very funny piece, part of his neoclassical adventures where he wants to sound sometimes like Mozart, sometimes like Tchaikovsky, and yet have a new twist on it. Sort of like doing those counterpoint exercises, but searching for a new way of relating the notes together. And you'll notice in the counterpoint exercises that things seem to shift. What happens if you want to freeze something and have everything else revolve around it? Well, before we do anything else, here's the intro. Look at the violas. And it's alto clef. Don't be afraid of the alto clef. Be afraid of violas, but don't be afraid of alto clefs. Did you hear the one about the guy, by the way, who left his viola in a car and he came back and the window was smashed and there were two violas inside. Right. Here we are. Anyway, in alto clef, this is a B flat major triad. Great. And sing along. I mean it. Sing along with me. Are you singing? I can't hear you. Come on, sing along. La, 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 la. Do you notice that? It's the same B flat major triad. That key keeps going. It's going and going. It's crazy. Because what happens around that is 
the harmony shifts, but the B-flat triad never goes away. And what that does is it freezes this tonality while other things are changing around it. And this is exactly what Arvo Parrot does in Fratres. And now, come on, don't play the recording if you want, but and, and it's in the playlist that I'm linking to, but try singing along. And, and uh, come on, I, I have no shame. I'll try to sing it and play it and sing together. And what I want you to hear is that things are going to change except for the viola. So it's basically B flat. And, and these red indicators here are the harmonies that are going on. They're a little bit difficult to describe, but it's just a way of showing you what the orchestra score is. And then there's the melody, which is a very Tchaikovsky ballet-like slow waltz thing. It's a really weird piece and I love it. Here we go. Here's the B flat and the viola start. And then, then the melody comes in. Many changes, la, la, but the violas keep going, la, and then the harmony changes again, la, but the violas keep going. La. Can you hear that? Here's a G major chord, and it's against the B flat here. La. Ooh, what's this chord? La. The B flat major tide is going. La. Major triad still going. La, 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 la. You get that delicious pull between the harmony, the melody, and this crazy triad in the middle. So let's try something else with our counterpoint exercise. It is a tintinabuli approach. More on that word later. So here's how we're going to alter the rules. We're saying, okay, we don't want to be Renaissance. That Stravinsky move the thing by a step was cool, but didn't give us the sort of spiritual underpinning that we're looking for. The Bartok thing was also very cool, but whoa, too saturated, too distracting for me right now. What if we hold a fixed triad in the new voice? Check it out. This voice, which you're writing against the same melody, is just this. In other words, we're going to the next lowest note that's a member of the triad that this seems to be in the mode of, and you get this result. Starting to sound a little familiar. Look at what we get. We get seconds here. We get some thirds and then a seconds that's leaped away from to another second. Just that's how it goes. And it doesn't sound quite as dissonant as the Stravinsky version where you just lower something by a step. And I think that's because you start to hear the aesthetics of this voice as something that is frozen, that this other top original voice just pulls gently away from. And okay, let's try an A minor triad this time. Let's just do the top two lines here. Uh, so in other words, I'm not doing a D triad. This time I'm doing an A minor triad. This doesn't really look like it's an A. What happens when we do a triad that's just a little farther away? Come on, counterpoint is fun. Do I sound too apologetic? Apologetic enough? Come on, counterpoint is fun. Here we go. It sounds very similar and that's cool. We can do two different things, a D minor triad and an A minor triad and get the same aesthetic result. That means something's going on and if you want to enrich the texture by having more than two voices, let's double this melody here, down a third, but let's get it out of the way of the middle voice. So take it down a third plus an octave. So now we're gonna have this. And 
And then we're going to add our A minor triad in the middle. And it's going to sound something like this. We not only get seconds and occasional dissonances, but we get beautiful triads in the middle of it all. Sometimes this looks like an F major 7 triad. Hey, this is just C major. Uh, what's this triad? Here, B flat CD, that's like a B flat triad with a 9. In other words, we're getting this kind of fixed frozen quality, but now since there's so many thirds when we're paralleling this voice, there's so many thirds that we're getting all these resonant reminiscences of tonality because we're suddenly adding triads, but it's not functional because we have this contrapuntal voice that is frozen in a fixed triad in the middle, just like the Stravinsky. And let's go one step farther. Now let's take this line and say, hey, I really want to be in a D minor that always has a leading tone. And that's all we're going to do. We're just going to add, we're going to essentially add accidentals to put this fixed line and its double into D harmonic minor. Got it? So here's what the new melody sounds like. Almost exactly the same, just that there's a C sharp. And we'll get a couple more C sharps in the bottom voice. Hear that? Here comes another one. sounds a little more pointed. That's what accidentals can do for you. It sounds just a little less monochromatic. We're getting some gentle chromatic shifts. Hey, chromatic kind of means color in a sense. The music has slightly more variants of color. Okay, so here we go. Here's this voice with this voice with the A minor triad in it. That's pretty. What's going on here? Look at this. See the C sharp and lower voice? And now there's a C natural in the upper voice. Ooh, pretty. And this is called a cross relation, where one voice has an accidental and then the other voice immediately corrects it or has a different version of that note in the next bar. And this didn't that sound a little bit like Arvo Paird? This is what Arvo Paird is doing in the piece. He has a central fixed line, which he calls the tin tinabuli because it reminds him of the bells. And in Estonia, there's lots and lots of churches and church bells in Tallinn. And it's remarkable. You just, if you have the chance to go there, you can just hear the bells echoing. And when bells echo, they don't change the pitch. They remind you of a certain constancy against which other things can move, sometimes in a pointed, searching direction. And the final step, I think, is let's abandon the fixed line. We've learned what we want to learn from the Cantus Firmus, but now I want to apply a process to the top line and since the middle line is fixed, maybe we can do something very deliberate. And look what Arvo Pert does. F, E, G, F. We start centered on the F, go down one, and then start from the top and come back. Then we go down two, and then start from two up, and then go down three. Remember, keeping the accidentals, and then come down from here. And now for an answering phrase, let's do that mirror inversion, but not like Bartok. Let's stay in the same mode. So where this went down one and then up, we're going to start up one. Whoops. Yep. And then come from here. And then we're going to go up two. And then we're going to start from two below. And then we're going to go and then start from three below. And then we're going to subject that to everything we've done before. Here is a fixed A minor triad. Here is our now process-oriented melody. Hey, 
Arvo Pärt grew up in serial music, and this is something that a lot of second-generation serial composers like Boulez and then, yeah, Stravinsky, when he started doing 12-tone music, would do things like this. Look for a pitch center, and in this case, it's the F, and then try to revolve or rotate arrays of pitches around it. Those other composers use very chromatic elements. Arvo Pärt here wants to use the modal elements that remind him of the religious underpinnings of this music. Modal elements that you might find in chant. And he picks the tintinabula voice in very interesting ways. He has lots of theories about this that he talks about. This is two full triadic notes below it. So, so he's picking this C because there's an E available here, but nope, I want the next one, C. He's picking this A because there's a C available here, but nope, he goes down to the A. So the approximate distance here is almost always the same. Therefore, it roughly follows the outline without being completely chained to it because it's a fixed voice. And listen to what you get through this whole process. Can you hear the ex melodic expans expansion? We go one down and then we're going to start from one more. And now we're going to add one more voice on the bottom. Good, and here we go. Ooh, nice A major that instantly goes. Ooh, and now starting from another note on the top. And it ends on a triad reminding us of our modal tonal roots and that it's so cool. This kind of music, which is very process oriented, which has a fixed voice, nonetheless reminds us of some very long ago neo-modal roots of music. And this is Fratres. This is it. Now, Arvo Pärt also adds rhythms. So the starting pitch of each phrase and the ending pitch of each phrase is a half note and an ending cadence of a dotted half note each time. So this will always be a half note. This will be a dotted half note. And therefore, the meter expands. And as you look through just the bar lines and the time signatures of Fratres, you can see a regular expansion of the meter and then it starts again. Because... And we're, it's almost time to listen to the piece again. To flesh out the whole piece, he needs to do something a little more than this. This won't quite get you an entire piece of music. But if you do this process and start on, I don't know, one note of this scale, an A, then you repeat this entire process up here on an F, then you repeat the entire process on a D, look, keep going down by thirds until you are done. And as in the serial music that Arvo Pärt grew up in, once that process is complete, the piece itself is complete and you're done. And you can see this in the scores. But before we look at the scores, let's talk about the aesthetics, the philosophy, and how we can link this aesthetics and philosophy to counterpoint those counterpoint assignments, they look dry, but they can lead to some pretty deep things. Too apologetic? Not apologetic enough? But, but look at what Arvo Pärt says about this process of tintinabulation. And for him, remember, tintinabulation is keeping that fixed triad in the middle. Here's what he says. Tintinabulation is an area I sometimes wander into when I am searching for answers in my life my music, my work. In my dark hours, I have the certain feeling that everything outside this one thing has no meaning. The complex and multifaceted only confuses me, and I must search for unity. What is it, this one thing, and how do I find my way to it? Traces of this perfect thing appear in many guises, and everything that is unimportant falls away. Tintinabulation is like this. Here, I am alone with silence. I have discovered that it is enough when a single note is beautifully played. This one note, or a silent beat, or a moment of silence, comforts me. 
I work with very few elements, with one voice, two voices. I build with primitive materials, with the triad, with one specific tonality. The three notes of a triad are like bells, and that is why I call it tintinabulation. So it's a deeply personal aesthetic. And we often search for unity in a meditative sense. We try to find out where we are and what is important. And sometimes we search for the ability to have the complex fade away. And this is true in life. It's true in music. Hey, it's true in music theory. We talk about music analytically so much in such complexity so that we can get or at least approach the simple unity at its heart. And of course, for Arvo Parrot, this is a religious, overtly religious thing. Paul Hillier, who is Arvo Parrot's biographer, says, in one of our discussions about Tintinabuli, Parrot described to me his view that the melodic lineal, that melody, the cantus firmus, always signifies a subjective world, the daily egoistic life of sin and suffering. The Tintinabuli voice, meanwhile, is the objective realm of forgiveness. The melodic line may appear to wander, but it is always held firmly by the tintinabuli line. This can be likened to the eternal dualism of the body and spirit, earth and heaven, but the two lines are in reality one line, a twofold, single entity. It's beautiful. I, I think you can actually hear it in the music. And how rare is it that composers say what they're trying to do and you can see so clearly what they're doing and then it all ends up actually meaning something. I think this is at the root of why this is such a popular piece. And here you can see the process. Here's the A he's going up to, starting from two. Here's the parallel thirds. Here's the tintinabuli voice in the middle. Then he adds another voice, going up three, coming down from three. Here's the parallel thirds, here's the tintinabuli voice. And then there's a comma, and he starts the same thing, but instead of on an A, now he's on the F. Here's just one voice, here's going down to, here's going from to above. And he goes on and on, quite a bit like this. Here's extending, you can see this is always starting with the half note and always ending on a three quarter notes starting on a half note, starting the process again. Hey, here's the mirror inversion of it. And why are there so many different versions of it? Well, I, I think it's a religious statement in and of itself in that this kind of religious seeking of unity in this duality can apply to anything and can be figured and ornamented in countless ways. So here, and this is the violin version, the violin is essentially triadicizing this process. It's a little more complicated than that, but it's essentially just playing these notes. Here's the outline. Here is what the violin is doing. Because of the nature of the violin, you can't always have the specific voicing, but it's essentially the same thing. And then to show again within one piece, hey, we could now do it in triplets, and we can go further up in different octaves. And sometimes the tintinabulary voice in the violin might be on the top, whereas here it's in the middle. It, it depends. There are different variations. And going back to the beginning where we started, here's the score. And now you can notice some things. Notice how the tintinabuli part is actually marked a little bit louder. God's voice is calling to us, and we're a little bit lost and in conflict in many different ways. That's what Avro Perk thinks. And here's a version for violin and piano where you can just see the figuration and have underlined in red and in blue the voices that are moving in parallel thirds, and everything else is a tintinabuli voice. And this is just a wonderful marvel. It is wonderful in that we get this extreme busyness of ornamentation with an underlying search for unity. And you don't have to be religious to appreciate this. You can see that there's a struggle going on or that there's an ornamentation over this other relationship. and. This can even be used as a film score. Why do you think this works with all of its religiousness so beautifully in this movie? Let me know in the comments 
of this video or come on over to Approaching Music Theory in Coursera and let me know in the comments there. Does this help? Does this mean something? Does this deepen your enjoyment of the piece? Why do you think it works so well in that film score? I want to hear from you. And now let's look at something completely, completely, completely different, but let's ask the exact same questions. Let's come up with a language that we can talk about this piece in. And let's ask ourselves, does it work? Does it help? This is A Walk to the Paradise Garden by Frederick Delius. And go ahead, pause and listen to it. It's shockingly beautiful. It's another completely beautiful piece and utterly different from the Arvo Parrot. Listen to it first if you're not familiar with it. And let's try to ask the question, how does this work? And let's try to answer Peter's question. Why does he love this piece so much? I think for this piece, we have to know just a little bit about Frederick Delius and what his influences were. He was born in England and then spent some time in Florida. What? And then essentially moved to France. So in other words, he has lots of different roots, but late in his career, he was sort of claimed by the British as a British nationalist composer. And I'll talk about what that means. But for now, I think it suffices for us to say he has lots of different musical roots, and I think they come out in the fact that we need to change our language as this piece goes. Let me show you what I mean. Here's the beginning. What do you think of this beginning? How would you describe it? Well, this is an E flat chord. thing going on underneath it? Well, it's a pentatonic melody. Pentatonic, remember, is just pentatonic scale. There's five notes. Oh, or you can play it on the black notes of the piano. There's something particular about pentatonic scales. For one thing, when you write a melody like this, in a pentatonic scale, you're evoking a certain kind of world that's often closer to oral tradition or folk music. And a lot of nationalist composers used pentatonic melodies. You can think of Edvard Grieg. Hey, that's pentatonic. Five, three, two, one, two, three, five, three, two, one, two, three, five, three, five, six, five, eight. I mean, it gets a little chromatic after that, but Edvard Grieg was one of these people we describe as nationalist composers. And what nationalist composers liked to do was take music that they thought or they dressed up as sourced from their homeland. And a lot of sources are folk sources and a lot of folk sources are pentatonic. So you also get people like Dvorak writing the New World Symphony. And one way to look at the New World Symphony as pentatonic explorations of a composer who's vastly influenced by Beethoven. And other composers used pentatonic scales as well. In a more experimental vein, Debussy uses pentatonic scales when he wants to float away from tonality but still be symmetrical. And the very interesting American composer Florence Price uses lots of pentatonic scales in her music, when similarly to Debussy, she wants, she wants to float away, but also to evoke an African-American folk tradition. So anyway, pentatonic scales, they're all over. They sound simple, they're very consonant, and they sound folky. So what does it mean to start a piece with a pentatonic scale? It means you're close to nature, that Romeo and Juliet are walking in nature. Before the tragic end, things are kind of peaceful. Sure they are. And now everything should be completely peaceful, right? Good. Okay, there's a couple added notes. It's not only pentatonic now. And let's get to here. The first chromatic pitch. And check this out. More chromatics, and that just seems to be passing down. And where do 
you want this to resolve to? Come on, sing the note where you want that D to resolve to. La, la. Right? You want it, you want it. And Delia says, nope, life just isn't like that when you're Romeo and Juliet. You don't get to resolve things like that. You resolve things like this. Nice. And then that C sharp also goes down. Ooh, and that C goes down to here. And that's a leading tone it wants to go up to here. But no, it goes down to here. Oh, it's gorgeous. So what happened to the pentatonic stuff? What happened to Edvard Grieg and nationalistic folk-oriented music? Well, Delius loved Grieg, and he was very forthright about it. And Grieg was a huge influence on him. And he also liked Chopin. And what Chopin did in many of his pieces is had exactly this kind of, oh, I'm passing, I'm passing, I'm passing. And I, any day now, the C-sharp will go up. Oh, not yet. Okay, this B-natural will go up. Oh, not yet. Oh, it's going down to a B-flat. Oh, oh, now it's here. And you get this lovely sense of disorientation that, come on, you know very well from pieces like this. It's so sad. Or wait, is it a perfume commercial? I don't know. Hmm. Okay. Everything's going down, and you think you know where you are. And do you hear this note? It's the leading tone, and where does it want to go? Come on, where does it want to go? It wants to go to here. Oh, but I'm too tired for that. It goes to here. And then here's the C sharp, and it wants to go to here. Oh, it goes to here. Anyway, Delius, of course, knew Chopin. And at some point, talks and writes about how influenced he was by Chopin. So this is a little bit of Chopin language. This is a little bit of Grieg language. And there's one other composer we have to talk about who does this. Check it out. When you're doing something chromatic and then you're lost and you don't want to quite go back to C natural, you just want to revolve to a strange area. Notice that he's making a theme of this and it's a different theme than this, and instead of being held in contrast to one another, like Beethoven, here's my theme, here's my theme transformed, or Mozart, here's a theme, and they're playing with this theme. Instead, it's a very Wagnerian play of themes. And in Wagner's operas, in the, all of his music, he loves using what he calls leading motives or light motifs, which themselves tell a dramatic story. And Romeo and Juliet is an opera by Delius, and the opera's not that successful, shh. But this segment of it is extraordinarily beautiful and is performed quite a bit. And because it's an opera, and because Delius liked Grieg and liked Chopin, he also shows his love for Wagner here. And let me show you what I mean by that. Here's a passage from Die Volkure the end of the first scene where Sigmund and Sibylinda are glancing at themselves and each other, except they're twins, and they fall in love. Anyway, it's a little too embarrassing to sing about, so the orchestra does the action for them. And that's a great way to understand this piece. The orchestra is showing Romeo and Juliet walking to their last place of happiness and stability, this village inn called Paradise Garden. And just as in Walk to Paradise Garden, in Valkyra, the themes tell the story. Check it out. Here it is. I forget which theme this is. I think it's Sigmund's. Yes, I don't know. It's embarrassing. But then the bass... By the way, when you're studying music, I hope you sing along. Okay, and now guess what he's gonna do? He's gonna sequence that theme. And it's really hard to know where the home is and that becomes important. Can you tell this is a sequence? And now...
And now the theme changes. I think this is the love theme. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Just as a side note, I'm happy to play these things and sing along because I want you to approach music like a true amateur, a true lover of music. And as you're studying these scores, pick out what you can. If you can't play piano well enough, play one line or just sing along. Being actively engaged in the music can help you connect the language of theory to emotion. And that's what we're engaged in. And look at this passage again. Here we go. Here's this passage. La, let's have a la, 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 and then over, I mean, la, and it goes la, la, la. It's just like the Wagner, where the themes change and they sink down chromatically, always in some kind of search. Or as a way to tell a story. So well, let's look just a little bit on, we can't, don't have time to play the whole thing, but here's a couple other tricks. When you listen to the recording and do go through the recording again, sing along with the green dots here. What are the green dots here? It's a descending large scale chromatic structure. And this answers the question, how do you put together a piece like this and still have a sense of form? Because look at the melody on top. Here we go. Hey, that's kind of like the opening melody. It's pentatonic. It's beautiful. Okay, it's sequenced down a step like Wagner does. And then a couple interesting... And then something different happens. And... and then repeats that part again. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. So listen to this passage again and notice that these themes are drifting around and they're held in place by the slow chromatic progression. And that's a way he can bind this section together. And there are other formal elements to this piece that might help you see how it's put together. There's definitely a sense of cadence and arrival. Sometimes it's just orchestrational thickness. Look, this is very thin. This is it's a big tutti, which means everybody in Italian. <laughs> Except for the tuba, because, you know, embarrassing. And here's some other segments where it's very full, and then it comes down again. And ooh, look, it's really thinned out. And hey, here's our same light motif. <laughs> we had before. And then we go back to the pentatonic. And then we have the pentatonic in a different place. It's a conversation between the different themes, some of which are evocative of a sort of naturalistic nationalism, some of which are evocative of this slippery, sighing Chopin chromaticism. And somehow all of them put together are sort of Wagnerian in interest, and you get this big tutti here, and then you get this lovely dying down over a pedal. And check this out, because if you also want to have a large formal element, sometimes it helps to have a pedal that everything is stopped. Remember, we've talked about this in the Coursera class. When Mozart has a pedal, everything stops, and it creates a certain amount of tension that things have to go on. Lots of spicy augmented chords. Very spicy. Double sharp. I don't even know what an F double sharp is. Oh, here we are. And here's, oh, it's a dominant chord, but not yet. And let's play this game. Where do you expect this to go? You expect it to go to here. But no, it goes to after this long pedal. What is that? And I'm sorry. It's objectively, scientifically beautiful. For certain values of the word scientific. But what is that? When you have a B pedal, 
And instead of going to an E, instead of going 5-1, you go 5 to 4, which you're not supposed to do in tonal function. This is known as a regression. You're going backwards tonally. And there was a piece that was written about 15 years before this piece that does this exact same chord progression at a big romantic duo moment in the exact same key. And yes, we talked about it from the Coursera class. It's from La Boheme, when the lovers first meet and they, I like this and you like this. And right before they're about to sing together for the very first time, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You get this big dominant chord and you think it's going to end on E5-1, but instead it goes la, 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 la. Also objectively beautiful. Like I said, no written 15 years before this piece. And that's just fine. Composers beg, borrow, steal all the time. Hey, he's borrowing from Grieg, but this piece doesn't really sound like Grieg. He's borrowing from Chopin. It doesn't really sound like Chopin. It sounds a little bit like Wagner, but it's too, I don't know, gentle for Wagner. And it approaches the sort of overt naturalistic romanticism of Puccini at the same time. And somehow Delius puts this all together in one package. In other words, it's a lot more heterodox than the Arvo Pert. And that makes sense because the Arvo Pert is all about narrowing things down to this one expression of duality that becomes unity. It's very ascetic. And this piece is the opposite of ascetic. It's extremely romantic. It's the two lovers in peace for the very last time, expressing their love in all these different waves, in these grand romantic gestures. And Delius was sort of claimed by the British, even though he no longer lived there, as a British nationalist composer because he joined the ranks of people like Gustav Holst and Rafe von Williams and Percy Granger, who all used folk-ish elements to sort of stir the nostalgia of a British home. And even though Delius probably didn't approach it in terms of being a British composer, you still get that same sense of nostalgia and longing and wonder you get when you listen to Vaughan Williams or when you listen to some of Holst's church music. So what do you think? I really want to know, and I really appreciate comments that are left here on YouTube and head on over to the Coursera class approaching music theory and go to the further explorations thread in the discussion section. And please tell me what you think I left out. Tell me what you think is inadequate about this, because when we talk about what the inadequacies of music theory and music analysis, if we talk about it in a compassionate and an exploratory sense, we can go deeper and deeper into the piece. Let me know what you think, and let me know what you want us to talk about next time. I think there's going to have to be some radio head. Until then, be well and stay safe.